Hi everyone, it's great to have you with us uh, at Park Road Anglican Church via parkroad.tv. Thank you for streaming us wherever and whenever you're watching this. It's great to have you with us. Uh, Now this week is a little bit different. Uh, This morning we had the MTS uh, recruit conference running and um, some of our regular 10am folks may have uh, enjoyed that session with Philip Jensen. Um, But in fact actually today is not really today. Uh, I don't want to get all back to the future on you, but some of or many of the elements of our service that you are watching right now have been pre-recorded, but through the magic of television, it'll all work out fine in the end, I hope. We're really glad you're streaming with us. Uh, Graham Mackay uh, is preaching for us in this service today. Uh, Graham, you may remember if you've been around at Park Road for a while, uh, was the interim minister for about a year, a couple of years ago. So it's great to have Graham with us today. Uh, He will be reminding us about the mission that we are called to be on as God's people. And indeed, this is a mission that is God's mission. So we're going to kick off with a couple of songs. Arise, my soul, remember this. He took my sin and he buried it no longer. reading tonight is from Luke chapter 10, verse 1 to 24. After this, 
the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go. I am sending you out like wolves, lambs amongst wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandal and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, Peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wage. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you have been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, you'll be lifted up to heavens. No, you'll go down to Hades. Whatever, whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father, no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but do not see it, and to hear what you hear, but do not hear it. Here ends our reading from Luke chapter 10. So it's really nice to be with you uh, this evening, to share with you uh, to, today and uh, next Sunday. We're just going to look at some of the passages from uh, the Gospel of Luke, from Luke chapter 10. Uh, as we think about the mission, and particularly uh, this evening, we're thinking about the fact that mission is God's mission. Uh, it's we share in it, we have a part to play, but ultimately it's his mission. So how about I pray, and then we'll look at this first part of the chapter. Father, we thank you so much that you are at work in this world. Uh, we thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ and the privilege that it is for us to be involved in the work of sharing the gospel uh, with those around us. Uh, please help us as we look at this part of your word to be challenged by it, to be encouraged by it, that we might serve you well. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of you may remember the mission um, that uh, was introduced by Peter Jensen when he was Archbishop. Uh, the goal of that mission uh, that was stated at the time, the goal was to see 10% of the population of the diocese 
in Bible-believing churches in the 10-year period of the mission. Uh, there was a lot of criticism of that goal of 10% at the time when that was stated. Uh, people said that's totally unrealistic, that can never be achieved, uh, impossible. And indeed, during the 10 years of the mission, that wasn't actually achieved, that 10% goal, uh, and it indeed it hasn't been since. Now, at the time, uh, Archbishop Jensen agreed that that is an impossible goal, at least in human terms, it's impossible. But he encouraged us to see that mission, in essence, is not a human activity that we undertake, but it is God's mission. And when it comes to God, there is nothing that is impossible. As we look at the world around us, as we look at the communities uh, in which we live and uh, the people that we work with, that we play with, uh, that task of bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to those around us can indeed seem at times impossible. Uh, it's, it's mission impossible, if you like. And yet God is at work. Now, we're grateful, of course, to God for the mission organisations that are committed to bringing the gospel to many parts of the world. Um, the Church Missionary Society, CMS, probably the best known of, of them uh, in our Anglican churches, but others as well, BCA, SIM and so on. Uh, they do a great job in bringing the gospel to uh, other parts of Australia and other parts of the world that we don't have access to ourselves. And we're grateful indeed to God for those who go out as missionaries. And I know that you as a church have missionaries that you particularly support uh, in the work that they do. But as we look at our own communities, um, where we live, um, the people that we work with, uh, the people that we interact with socially or, or via social media or whatever it might be, how effectively do we reach out with that good news of Jesus to people around us. It can seem really an impossible task. Uh, when we stop and think about it, it really isn't all that long ago. It can seem like a long time, but it's not that long ago we were able to physically travel to just about any part of the world. Uh, I guess more recently many of us have learnt pretty rapidly how to use technology uh, to communicate with sometimes our next-door neighbours and indeed our own family members. And we can do that with any part of the world. And yet it's really hard to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So often it can feel that in our kind of Western society, there's a growing hardness and a resistance, even a hostility and intolerance towards the Christian message. Now, that's nothing new. Uh, and in the opening verses of uh, Luke chapter 10, uh, the passage that has been read to us, we read about this mission in which Jesus sent out his followers, uh, 72 of them, sent them out in pairs. Now, if you were to glance back to the beginning of Luke chapter 9, we read there about the mission of the 12, that sort of inner band of followers of Jesus. But now it's a larger group that are sent out in this work of mission. Uh, your Bible here in chapter 10 may have a little footnote that uh, says that some of the manuscripts say there were 70 of them, uh, others say 72. I don't think the precise number is that important. But we get the clear message that this work of mission is something that is, is broader than just that inner band of followers of Jesus. This is a larger group involved in the work of mission. Now, I think it's worth saying that this particular uh, activity, this particular set of circumstances is quite distinctive. At, it's something that happened at that point in time. I don't think we should take it that uh, uh, it's a blueprint for the way mission always has to be. If you like, it's more descriptive of what actually happened rather than being prescriptive of the way mission always has to be. But nevertheless, I think there are some principles here that we can take on board as we seek to engage in the work of mission today. The words of um, verse, verse 2 of chapter 10 uh, addressed 
to those 72 who were about to go out, I think are incredibly relevant for us today. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now here I think is the core rationale for the work of mission. Uh, and I want to spend a bit of time on just that verse before we move on a bit more quickly to the rest of the passage. I think we need to understand the principles that we see here, uh, otherwise we may be wasting our time. There are four key words here, and we'll look at them one at a time. The first word is that word harvest. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful. Now, of course, that's an agricultural image, um, context of farmers. Perhaps most of us are city seekers and might, might not mean a lot to us. But indeed, this idea of harvest is a very powerful image in the Bible as well. Um, it's an image that looks to the final gathering of God's people. There's a sense of finality to it, that the, the farmer sows his seed and then he waits for the seed to germinate and he tends his crops and he hopes that the rain will come at the right time and the pests won't come and attack it. And then finally the day comes when it's ready to be harvested and that's it. That's what the farmer is all about. The Bible looks to that final day, that final day when all human beings from every part of the world, from every generation, will stand before the creator of the whole universe for judgment. will answer to him. And the sad reality is that many people will not be willing, will, sorry, will not be ready for that great day. I guess perhaps to put it in simple terms, the task of mission is to prepare men and women and boys and girls for that great day of harvest. Now, the world around us really doesn't think in these sort of terms. Life goes on day to day, year to year, generation to generation. Sooner or later, the human body wears out and eventually it's gone and the next generation comes and takes its place. And that cycle that goes on and on forever, that's the way the world thinks. But that's not the view of the Bible. And it's not the way that we as Christian people are to think. There was a beginning, creation. God brought all things into being. And there will come an end, that day of judgment, that time when all will stand before the Creator and answer to him. But many will be unprepared. The harvest is plentiful. How do you think about the people around you um, who are not followers of Jesus Christ? Uh, those in the world around us, perhaps our friends, perhaps members of our own family who are not followers of Jesus. Perhaps it's easy to, easy to see them as resistant, as people who have become hardened to the gospel, and indeed many have. People who really have no idea sometimes what the Christian faith is all about. So many of them that just don't even seem to care about it. But perhaps we should think about them as being part of that great harvest, just waiting to join in the great throng of people who are ready. And those of us who are ready for that day of judgment, not for a moment because we think that we're somehow better than other people, but rather we're ready because we're trusting in Jesus, because of what Jesus has done for us, because of the gift of eternal life that Jesus gives to those who put their trust in him. And that's the great message that we want to share. Second key word is workers. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. 
uses just that one word to describe the work as few. Perhaps we might want to add that we can sometimes feel pretty weak, um, pretty helpless, scared, overwhelmed by the task, intimidated by those who may oppose us. But notice that Jesus does describe his followers as workers. We have a role to play. We're not just sort of tagging along for the ride. We have a job to do. We have a role to play in this great project. Uh, it's a few years ago now that I retired from serving as full-time chaplain uh, at Liverpool Hospital. Uh, it was interesting at the time when I told people that I was about to retire, there were several who made comments about ministers never really retiring. Uh, it's interesting, I've been doing a little stint back there at Liverpool Hospital, filling in for one of the chaplains who works there now, just recently. Uh, and I bumped into uh, a nurse in one of the wards that I'd got to know when I was there, uh, who was one of the people that made that very comment uh, about ministers never retiring. He told me that uh, after 42 years working at Liverpool Hospital, he was about to retire himself. And there does come a time when uh, those of us who are privileged to be part of uh, the work of full-time ministry uh, are ready to hand that over to uh, other people, to younger people. But it is true in a sense that none of us who is a follower of Jesus ever retires from being a worker in God's mission. Now, of course, what that means to be a worker will vary from person to person, circumstances to circumstances, uh, depending on the gifts that God has given to us, and that will change over time. There will be some today who will be called literally to go, as were that 72 who were with Jesus. There are some who will go as missionaries, uh, some who will serve as, as ministers, others that will engage in mission, perhaps in a full-time capacity or part-time, whatever it might be. Um, all of us, depending on our circumstances, uh, should be asking ourselves whether God may be calling us to be a part of this work of mission, or perhaps I should say in what way God may be calling us to be involved in his work of mission. Uh, for some of us, being a worker may simply involve perhaps what we might describe as a support role, uh, including at the very least prayer and giving. I say at the very least, but and yet prayer is one of the most important contributions to the work of mission. And indeed, without uh, financial and other kinds of mission of support, missions wouldn't be able to happen. We can, of course, also be workers in God's mission in our own homes, uh, in our workplaces, in our neighbourhoods. We don't have, any, have to have any particular role or label or uh, identity, but we're workers. Third key word here is that word ask. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So what can we do about that situation? Jesus says to you, he says to me, as he said to those disciples back then, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. Now, I need to warn you that that's a very dangerous thing to do. It's a very risky activity for us to pray that God will send out people into the work of mission. The reason I say it's dangerous is because you may well find that the answer to your prayer is staring at you every time you look into a mirror. God may be calling you to go in a particular way. Prayer. Asking God. It's something, of course, that always ought to be at the heart of our work of mission. Uh, in the... Uh, diocesan mission that I mentioned uh, a little while ago, uh, there was a lot of 
planning and strategies and goals and objectives and all these things were written down and numerous special events were planned and they took place. But there was also a recognition that nothing significant is going to happen without prayer. Prayer is an essential part of the work of mission. No amount of human activity and planning and activity can ever really bring about change. It requires prayer. Then there's the sender. So there's the harvest, there's the workers, there are the askers, and finally there is the sender, God himself. Notice again how God is described here. The Lord will send out workers into his harvest field. It's not that we thought up this great idea of mission and then we ask God to help us in our plans. It's his harvest field and therefore he is the one who sends. In sending them out, Jesus gives the 72 instructions. He tells them what to expect. Firstly, there's danger in the work. Verse 3, go, he says, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. And it's urgent. Verse 4, do not take a purse or bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone in the road. There's going to be a mixed response. Verses 5 and 6, when you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. And then a bit further down in verses 10 and 11. When you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet, we wipe off against you. They will be dependent on other people. And that can be hard because it requires humility. You won't always get everything that you would like. Verses 7 and 8. Jesus says, stay in that house, eating and drinking, whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what's set before you. Now, if all of that sounds a little bit negative, uh, the positive comes in verse 9 with his instruction. He says to them, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come. Now, that, of course, is exactly what Jesus did. As we read the Gospels, that's what Jesus is doing, healing the sick, telling people the message of the kingdom. Uh, we see it again and again, Jesus raising people even from the dead, telling people about the kingdom and his proclaiming, his telling people the good news of the kingdom was always drawing people to himself because it's in Jesus and through faith in him that people can become part of this great work that God is doing in this world, bringing this kingdom into being. Jesus sends out the 72, tells them to heal. Now, I don't want to get too caught up on the question of healing as part of the mission that we're engaged in today. Uh, let me say, firstly, that this mission that the 72 were involved in, it apparently did involve miraculous healings. And we see that, of course, in Jesus' work. But that's distinctive. I don't think we should necessarily expect that all the time. Second thing perhaps to say is that this work of, of healing, um, as, as we involve ourselves in the work of mission in our world today, there's a lot of caring for the needs of the people that we come into contact with, uh, providing for people's physical and material and, and medical needs. Uh, caring for the body as well as the soul. A lot of our mission work for, through our great mission organisations involves caring for people who are in need, whether that's through uh, medical services or providing food or uh, development assistance or education, community support. Caring for people, but it also involves telling people how they can become part of this great kingdom. And that kind of uh, practical caring 
is, of course, also a part of what we do as a, as a church. Uh, each one of our local churches, we're involved in caring for one another, uh, people that are part of our community and indeed people beyond our own community, providing that kind of care. That's what organisations uh, such as Angry Care are doing, providing mission on our home doorstep. So why is this work of mission so important? That's the focus of the next five verses. Uh, Jesus told the disciples to wipe the dust from their feet in the towns that wouldn't listen. And then in verse 12, he says to them, I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day, that's the day of harvest, for Sodom than for that town. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah, you might remember from the Old Testament, uh, were towns, cities that were destroyed by God's judgment because they turned their back on God. Uh, verses 13 through to 15, Jesus says, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that had been performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. Rejecting Jesus, it's a serious business. There are consequences. It's quite a simple message, but it's very confronting. When that day of harvest comes, that day of final judgment, those who've rejected Jesus, rejected his offer of life, who've turned their back on him, on that day and indeed for eternity, will regret that choice and will face the consequences of it. Verse 16 is a key verse here. Jesus says, whoever listens to you listens to me. And whoever rejects you rejects me. And whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. That's God the Father. So these words of Jesus, I think on the one hand, uh, they're a challenge to take seriously this work of mission. Now, we're keen, of course, to see people come to believe what we believe. Uh, we're keen to see more people in our churches when we can have more people in our churches. Uh, we're keen to see Australia become a more Christian society. But what we want is not the point. What matters most about the work of mission is seeing people get right with God now and for eternity. They're a challenge to us, but these words of Jesus are also an encouragement to us especially when the work of mission can seem hard and it can seem unfruitful. Uh, we face opposition, maybe even persecution. When that happens, we don't take it personally. It's not about us. It's about God. It's not us that is being rejected. It's God who is being rejected. And therefore, we don't give up even when it is hard, and it can seem like there's very little in the way of response. We don't know how long those 72 were out on the work of mission or how much territory they covered, but down in verse 17, it tells us that they returned with joy. They were pretty excited about what was happening, about what they experienced. They say, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. I'm not quite sure what that means, but it makes it very clear in the, the comments that Jesus makes uh, in the next verse or so, make it clear that this is a spiritual battle that they're involved in. Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. You see, this is not just about 36 pairs of blokes wandering around the countryside, 
spruiking new religious ideas that they'd thought up. This was God. This is God at battle with Satan. And although Satan may put up a valiant struggle, in the end there is not the slightest doubt as to who is going to win. This is God who is at work. But Jesus brings this uh, perhaps overexcited 72 of them back down to earth, or really he, he lifts their sights to heaven. Here's the real reason for, joy, for rejoicing, verse 20. He says, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's something for us to just pause and to reflect on and to rejoice in. When we're involved in the work of mission, there may well be times when it's pretty exciting and it's fantastic when you see things happening and people responding to the gospel and putting their faith in Jesus. But there can also be times of discouragement, perhaps even despair. Now, we don't have any control over the way that other people may respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we do take responsibility for our own personal relationship with God. And we can and we do, or at least we certainly should rejoice in that assurance that we have of a relationship with God, that we are right with God now and indeed for eternity, that we are ready for that great day of harvest again, not because of anything that we have achieved in ourselves, not because we're any better than anybody else, but because of what Jesus has done for us. Rejoicing. And did you notice that Jesus himself also is rejoicing? Verse 21. Luke tells us at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was what you were pleased to do. Now, if you notice the reference to the Trinity there, uh, here is Jesus, the Son of God, speaking in praise to God, the Father, full of joy through the Holy Spirit. All three persons of the Trinity involved in this great work of mission. Verse 22, Jesus says, All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. The final note of this joyful return of the 72 uh, is, I think, for us a reminder of the very great privilege of being involved, participants in this great work that God himself is doing in this world. Verses 23 and 24. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. I don't know if you sometimes think, I think I, I do sometimes, uh, how great it would have been to have been there with Jesus physically, perhaps to have been one of those 72 that had been sent out by Jesus, to have been a, a part of what was happening. But I don't think that's what Jesus is speaking about here. It's seeing the work of the kingdom being done. It's seeing mission happen. And it's seeing people come to faith in Jesus Christ. What an extraordinary privilege and joy it is that we can be part of what God is doing in the world today. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you so much for these words that come to us from the Gospel of Luke as we read of the 72 that Jesus sent out in the work of mission. Father, as we pause and reflect on what that great mission was like then, we're encouraged to think further about the work of mission that we're involved in here and now today in this world around us. Help us, we pray, never to lose sight of the fact that this is your work, but you call us to be part of it. Help us to be prayerful, asking that you will send out workers for this great work of mission and that we ourselves might be open to the role that you've called us to have. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you haven't met me before, my name's Jacob, and I'll be leading us in prayer this evening. So please pray with me. 
Heavenly Father, as Psalm 62 verse 8 encourages us and reminds us, we are to pour out our hearts to you for you are our refuge. We thank you for how clearly you've been a refuge to us this year. And we thank you that we can give you all of our worries, our fears, concerns and grievances to you. Uh, We pray especially then for those in the congregation who are doing Year 12 this year. In particular, we pray for Venetia, Lydia, Kira, Tristan, Edmund, Jacqueline and Oliver who are either completing the HSC, IB or just HSC Mass. Uh, We thank you for how you've sustained them, comforted them and helped them throughout this year already. And we pray that you'd continue to do so uh, over the next period as they study and conduct their exams. Help them also in the midst of this stressful time to continue to seek you and rejoice in you and your salvation. Uh, For the rest of us, help us also to delight in your word, like the psalmist in Psalm 1 does, um, and to meditate on it day and night. Uh, We pray that it fill every spot, every space of our minds, um, so that our lives would be lived in full submission to you. And Father, Please protect us like a shield from the temptations and misplaced desires of the word and the flesh. Deliver us also from the power of Satan so that we might triumph over our sin and live holy lives according to your will and purpose. Uh, Help us then to lead uh, lead us um, into your ways of righteousness. Uh, And Father, help us to be fully reliant on you and desire you most of all. Uh, Help us to be able to say like the psalmist in Psalm 4, You have put more joy in my heart than others have when their grain and wine abound. May we therefore be content not when the things of the world abound in our life, but when you abound in our life. And may we be able to peacefully uh, peacefully rest in your presence, as we know that you hear our prayers and delight to answer them. And finally, Father, help us to see your majesty and glory as the psalmist recognizes in Psalm 8. Your name is majestic in all the earth. Your glory can be seen in all of creation. And rather, despite, uh, surprisingly, despite how small we are in this vast universe, you have loved each and every one of us and do so in a personal way. Help us as your people to proclaim this message of your greatness and your love to all people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah.
We're really glad that you've joined us for this service, wherever and whenever you're watching. We're glad to have had you with us on Park Road TV at Park Road Anglican Church. Uh, We hope that you'll join us next week, uh, where we'll be, again, digging into the Bible, finding out uh, what it is that God has to say to us uh, as we seek to live for him and play our part in the work that he's doing in the world. God bless, and we hope to see you then.